Hello, today we're going to look at VMFX uh, Virtual Machine Fabric Extension by Cisco. Uh, prominently used in the Cisco UCS platform, but also prevalent in things like Nexus platform. Uh, and I'm sure will be present in a lot more future products. So definitely well worth having a, a chat about it today. So what we'll cover, we'll talk about what it is, uh, why would we want it, uh, what do you need in order to use it, and how do you set it up? Um, there seems to be a lot of confusion around fabric extension technologies, uh, so I thought it'd be worth having a quick recap on the different fabric uh, extension uh, implementations and how they differ, just so we know exactly what uh, we're talking about when we talk about VMFX. Okay, so four main fabric extension implementations we have RackFX, ChassisFX, AdaptFX and VMFX. So RackFX, the best way to think of any fabric extension implementation is basically taking our switch, uh, we're probably all familiar with the Catalyst 6500 range from Cisco, uh, probably the best selling data center switch there is. Uh, the 6500 has a concept of supervisor modules which provide the control plane functions, the intelligence if you will, and the line cards which provide the data um, layer, <coughs> the data plane, um, which basically provide the movement of the traffic. So with fabric extension what we're essentially doing is taking that line card, pulling it out of the chassis and extending it, in the case of RackFex, to the top of a rack. So what's the benefits of doing this? Well there are several. The main ones are we're getting the benefit of a top of rack solution i.e. localized cabling to the servers, uh, nice neat short cables but without the um, added management overhead that a top of rack um, implementation would normally provide. Uh, normally when we're doing a data center implementation you'd normally have to make a decision whether you're going to use an end of row architecture or a top of rack architecture. There's benefits to each, the top of rack benefits as we've just mentioned, localized cabling within the cabinet, um, the end of row architecture, the main benefit there is you've only got a single switch to manage. However, you're having to cable all your racks back to that end of row switch. So longer cables required, more cabling, so yeah, le less efficient. With RackFex, we actually get the best of both worlds. We've got the top of rack efficiencies with the localized cabling, but that top of rack switch does not add another point of management. The management of that top of rack switch is entirely with the controlling bridge or the, the end of row switch. So single point of management, but we can extend those line cards out beyond the chassis, uh, which is the point of RackFex. Typical implementation of RackFex would be a Nexus 2000 at the top of a rack, uh, cabled back to its controlling bridge, which would generally be a Nexus 5000 or 7000. Next we have ChassisFex, which basically does exactly the same thing. However, we're now extending our line card directly into our chassis. So we've got all the efficiencies we had with RackFex, um, within this case we're actually putting our line card directly into the chassis. So all our blades in the front of that chassis will be um, silicon connected to the back plane and the only physical cabling we've got to our chassis is between the fabric extender back to its controlling bridge. Uh, that cabling is essentially the back plane uh, extension. So reduced cabling, um, end of row management, so we've similar only got one point of management. That fabric extender within the chassis is not an additional point of management. Um, there's no management required for that. All the management functions for that fabric extender within that chassis are within the central um, switch itself. All those ports on that fabric extender within the chassis would just appear as if they're a local port within that um, controlling switch. Um, this would differ from some other uh, vendor implementations which actually put um, fully functional standalone switches if you will in the blades uh, chassis however they all present a an additional point of management and generally speaking with 
uh, any um, s chassis architecture would have two in there for redundancy so adding two fully functional standalone switches within each rack in your data center your points of management and your spanning tree domains are, are really going to crank up fairly rapidly uh, fabric extenders however no additional points of management so a, a great benefit there a typical example of a chassis fex would be a Cisco UCS fabric interconnect to a chassis IO module. Okay, so we're now moving more into the, the virtual realms uh, with adapter effects. But again, exactly the same policy and uh, principles apply. We're simply taking our line card and extending it into the server this time and actually into a mezzanine adapter within the server. Uh, but essentially all the um, interface that we would dynamically create on that mezzanine adapter just appear like they're locally connected to our controlling bridge. So again, so increased host visibility on the network. There's no additional cabling. We've still got that um, backplane cabling, if you will, to our to our fabric extender, and still a single point of management. You can see there we're still actually using the hypervisor uh, V switch, the software switch within uh, the hypervisor, which in turn will just uplink to our fabric extender within our mezzanine adapter. Typical implement implementation of adapter FEX would be a Cisco UCS fabric interconnect to the Cisco VIC, the M81KR, sometimes referred to as the Paolo adapter. Um, it's worth noting that if you use UCS, you're using adapt effects whether you know it or not. There's no additional real uh, configuration to do, it's just that's how it works out of the box. So now we come to VMFX. Um, I think a lot of the confusion that I've heard around VMFX generally comes through uh, or comes from the various names that it's just gone under. It was originally known as PTS, pass through switching. Um, they then changed the name to VNLink in hardware. Uh, when we talk about a VNLink, uh, as we've mentioned, when I create a virtual NIC on our fabric extender, that immediately creates a corresponding virtual Ethernet port within our controlling bridge, or our, our main switch, if you like. That relationship between that virtual NIC and that virtual Ethernet card gets tied together with a virtual piece of cable. And that relationship between that virtual NIC and that virtual Ethernet card is known as a virtual network link, a VN link. So VN link purely is, is the relationship between those two entities. Uh, VMFX was uh, previously referred to as VN link in hardware because that's exactly what we're doing. We're switching uh, VMs in hardware in the ASICs in the UCS's instance in the fabric interconnect. So we're completely bypassing the software switch. So as you can see, we're actually moving that fabric extender right within the hypervisor. So if you've noticed that with every advancement in the VMFX family, we're moving our virtual line card, we're pulling it out of our chassis and moving it ever closer to the line to the workloads, in this case, the virtual machines. Mm -hmm. To the point now with VMFX, where our line card sits inside the hypervisor, replacing the vSwitch, so our virtual machines are in effect directly plugging in to our, our our switch, our physical switch, just as if we were uh, talking about a physical switch, a physical um, host plugging into a physical switch. So our virtual world is now very logically mapping onto our physical world. It's the same. It's the same architecture now. Uh, we're not now using uh, a different architecture for our virtualized environment to our physical environment. Great benefit of this is that we now have visibility down to our virtual machine level, something we never had before. Uh, previously, if I, as a network administrator, was to assign a port to a virtualization administrator, he would then take that port, plug in his ESX or whatever host, he would then configure up his uh, software switches, his vSwitches, I would then lose visibility of my network edge. Um, and it's something I hear a lot from network people that um, 
virtualization administrators aren't security administrators they're not network administrators so there there is sometimes some discomfort about leaving that control within the virtualized uh, the virtualization administrator however with vmfx that is now uh, put back in the hands of the network administrator um, so what we're doing with the vmfx we're actually replacing the vswitch uh, we're creating a distributed vSwitch, a DVS, uh, within the um, hypervisor, and we're plugging our virtual machines directly into that. Uh, and with the uh, mezzanine adapter, we're actually creating dynamic virtual NICs, which are then applied individually to those VMs. And those dynamic uh, virtual NICs, we have complete visibility of through UCS Administrator. Typical implementation of VMFX would be uh, Cisco UCS Fabric Interconnects, and you must use the Cisco VIC, the M81KR, previously or sometimes referred to as its codename, the Paolo Adapter. Worth mentioning at this stage, there's actually two sub-modes of VMFX. You've got VMFX Emulated Mode, uh, which is the, the default mode, if you will, uh, where we have a individual VNIC created on our mezzanine adapter, our Cisco VIC. That VNIC is on a, given on a one-to-one -one basis to a virtual machine. And that VNIC on the mezzanine adapter card actually has a one-to-one -one relationship with its virtual Ethernet port on our switch. So in effect, you see there, we have a VM directly plugged into our virtual Ethernet port of our switch. So from that switch, we have complete visibility of all the statistics, all the traffic patterns uh, of that VM. We can also apply a policy to that VM, just as we can with a physical Ethernet interface. So again, our virtual world is now mirroring our physical world. The other implementation of VMFX is set up identically. However, there are a few little other um, configurations you need to make through uh, VMware and that is using VMFX with PCIe pass-through or more commonly now known as VM direct path mode. Some to, sometimes I've also referred refer to it as um, optimized mode or performance mode. Um, and that's when we're using VMFX in conjunction with VMware direct path IO, which is where you're actually bypassing the hypervisor completely. So offloading any um, uh, computation requirements from the host itself. So there is uh, a performance gain to be had with that. Um, I'm going to concentrate more on the VMFX emulated mode uh, in this session. That's the one we're going to set up. I may well just do the additions to set up VMFX uh, VM direct path mode as a supplement uh, to this presentation. OK, so VMFX, why would we want it? Um, well, as I've mentioned, it provides VM level interface statistics and policy enforcement. Um, so we have a consistent policy for both our physical and our virtual machines. Uh, the VMFX or the distributed virtual switch, if you in to use VMware terms, is not created by the virtualization administrator anymore. It's created by the UCS manager administrator. Uh, which could be a network admin uh, with the if it's using the role-based access control with the network administrator role. We have improved performance, um, as we mentioned, that we can actually get wire rate switching per VM uh, if used in conjunction with the VMware Direct Path I/O. Uh, we can have up to 116 of these virtual adapters per mezzanine card with the latest implementation of the VIC. So that's 115. 116 servers potentially uh, using VMware Direct.io. Um, vMotion is supported in both modes, so we're not breaking anything by using VMFX. The supported hypervisors for VMFX are currently Red Hat KVM and VMware's vSphere, vSphere 4 and 5. Also worth mentioning at this stage, um, a question I have been asked previously is what's the difference between VMFX and the Nexus 1000V? <clears throat> I'm not really going to cover too 